It seems like senators have their minds made up here. I know you're talking to lawmakers all the time, but just how bad is it for Facebook this time? Well, it's not great. I think, though, when it, as far as the hearing uh, today, when it comes to focusing on things that uh, you hear parents and teenagers really concerned about, I think the Senate kind of whiffed in the sense that they focused really on these kind of prosecutorial questions about um, will Facebook publicly share its research, uh, how Facebook treats whistleblowers, who's going to make the product decisions, a lot of questions along those lines. Very few questions really almost, uh, asked about, you know, how do we improve the online experience for kids? How do we prevent teen self-harm? Um, what about updating our kids' privacy laws? Do they make sense? Do the age rules make sense? How do we disincentivize parents from lying about their tween's age? It would be great to see Congress work together with industry to devise some old solutions, because I think that's what parents want, but that's not really what we saw today. Lori, would you agree with that? I mean, it certainly seems to me like Facebook is under more pressure, more scrutiny than it's ever been under before. And when you're questioning the intentions of, of how much they care about children, that gets pretty deep. Lori? Yeah, and I think that people, to some degree, can you hear me? Yep, I got you. You know, I think that to some degree, I think people have lost and, and you know, the government politicians, I think people, and I remember this with Cambridge Analytica back in the day in this privacy the scandal that everyone was just racking their brains over. I think people have lost their patience, and I think this is a very, very big deal. Um, and, you know, it was interesting to hear Facebook's head of security talk about some of these changes that they're considering, like a nudge uh, if, if people are going down the rabbit hole and they could potentially bring them some better content. Uh, the idea of like a take a, a break, uh, take a break ex exploration tool. But, you know, it's to me, it seems as though and I know um, this is a sentiment that shared that oftentimes it takes a lot of public pressure and a lot of media pressure for some of these things to come out and for some of these things to be done. And I think the big question is, obviously, you know, if all of this information was there and ready, why didn't we see products uh, to, to help children before. And as a matter of fact, they were actually going to, you know, launch a product for children without all of this information known to the public. So I think the patience, the patience is wavering. Antigone Davis explained to the senators Facebook's train of thought and that the goal of some of this research was to actually help children in the long run to better understand. Take a listen to what she had to say. I believe that it is better for parents to have the option to give tweens access to a version of Instagram that's designed for them, where parents can supervise and manage their experience. That's why we've been working on delivering age-appropriate parent-supervised experiences, something YouTube and TikTok already do. Adam, as someone who worked at Google for many years, I'm curious what you make of that argument. YouTube Kids does exist. I actually spoke to Susan Wojcicki just a few days ago. I asked for her thoughts on this. She said she thinks YouTube is valuable to, to teens' mental health because you have creators uh, and influencers out there talking about their own life experiences. Is Instagram different or potentially more harmful in your view? Well, here's what we know. We know that kids are going to be online no matter what politicians say. If you fa if you rewind 10 years ago, what was happening is that they were on services that were really designed for adults, like main YouTube. Thankfully, in the last several years, we've seen more of these services like YouTube Kids, as you mentioned, Messenger Kids, Apple's Family Sharing, and they provide really kind of a parentally supervised sandbox for younger kids. The challenge is when kids reach that tween age, 11 and 12, they start wanting more independence and kind of breaking out of that parental sandbox. And because of COPPA, the kids' privacy law, services are basically parents, many parents, um, lie about their kids' age when they reach that uh, age. That's not a good situation. I think that's not really desirable public policy. One of the things I think you're seeing Facebook doing is recognizing that even though a 13 year old can be on Instagram, they want to give them kind of a different experience than an older teen. And I think that makes sense. Now, as you say, Adam, more and more kids are online now. And I think uh, one of the main concerns here is the, the real intentions of, let's say, a Mark Zuckerberg or an Adam Masseri, the head of Instagram. You know, they obviously they have children. They often invoke their children in conversations about uh, kid safety on the platform. Adam Masseri brought his own kids up when he said they were pausing Instagram kids. Lori, you know, you as well as I have interviewed a number of these executives in the past, and people are always asking, what are their intentions? I mean, you know, do they really want to hurt our children? And I'm curious how you how you approach right. that.
question because it seems to get to the heart of what infuriates the public about what we're hearing here. You know, it's interesting because in the time that I've covered technology, which we've been in this for a long time, over a, over a decade, I think the thing that gets lost sometimes is the humanity, right, in, in a lot of this. And and do I think Mark Zuckerberg and Adam Mosiri, who I met both of these are these folks, are trying to actively harm our children? I, I don't know. That being said, I think Facebook has had trouble anticipating what will come and, and the negative backlash of the product. And I think to kind of understand, and I think this is actually an interesting point, to understand how we got here and what could be particularly harmful now that Instagram is getting its day, right? Because as uh, as you said earlier, we've heard Facebook at these hearings. We haven't heard Instagram. I think it's important to note that Instagram has changed so much over the last couple of years. Um, you know, when Facebook acquired Instagram back in the day, it was Instagram was supposed to remain separate. It wouldn't be involved too much with Facebook. And then you had Instagram's founders, uh, Kevin Systrom and, and Mikey and Mike leave. And, and I think um, that changed a lot. And in the last couple of years, and last year in particular, a lot has changed on the product side, right? It's um, integrated quite a bit more with Facebook. There's a shopping tab. So, you know, there's more, uh, there, there's, it's easier to get more attention there. So, you know, I think you have to understand that this is a product that has changed over the, the last couple of years, and you have to take it from that approach. And what does that mean for our children? And I think you're seeing that in some of these uh, some of these studies that came up. And I'll, and I'll just mention, you know, I think Facebook is building out a, another dimension. They're devoting quite a bit of money and time into the metaverse. And we've got to really have a, a conversation about even the metaverse and this this idea that they want to build a better world in the virtual space and what that's going to mean for our children. Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is all happening at the same time that China is cracking down on children's access to technology. And I thought there was a particularly interesting quote from Senator Sullivan saying he's not a fan of China, but agreeing with the Chinese government about wanting to limit the time teens are spending on social media and gaming platforms. Uh, he said, I believe that we're going to look back 20 years from now and see the massive social and mental health challenges that were created by this era. Maybe it might be the one time where we say, why didn't we, like the Chinese Communist Party, say, take a break? Adam, what's your reaction to that? Just, uh, I was just completely amazed that one of our senators would look with admiration upon what, a chi what the Chinese government has done. Look, uh, if we take a step back, we, we need to take a holistic look about how kids and families are using technology. Uh, during the pandemic, social media messaging, these were critical lifelines for many kids who were stuck at home, a critical way for them to stay in touch with their friends. Two thirds of teenagers said that social media was important to them uh, during the pandemic. And yet technology isn't always good. We know, and this comes out in the research, that sometimes it can make things harder for teenagers. But what I hear is parents you know, grappling with a lot of these questions about screen time, bullying, jealousy, and kids are going through their adolescence online, the good, the bad, the ugly. We need to do everything possible to create a safe online space, good laws that support that. The kids can have a positive experience online. But sheesh, following China's lead, that's just bonkers. I'm curious, Adam, what you think of how Facebook has handled this whole situation from a, from a communications perspective. You know, it seems like at least from uh, you know from the, the the public perception the brand trust so much of, uh, has been lost and facebook just can't win yeah i do i i wonder if there's a little bit of a gap between what journalists and kind of a you know politicians focus on and what the average person focuses on um you know have i would i do everything the way they've done it no but I do think one of the things about the coverage is that it holds up a mirror to the company. And look, sometimes looking in a mirror can be painful. Sometimes looking in a mirror can illuminate blind spots. Um, I think one of the things you've seen happen over the last couple of weeks as the stories have come out is that they've tried to see how um, the world sees them and act accordingly. They put a pause on Instagram kids, but they've also done things like roll out, uh, announce their intention to roll out new parental supervision tools for younger teens on Instagram. Look, so sometimes that holding up of a mirror can be painful, but ultimately, you know, if they pursued growth at the expense of a positive experience for their users, then a lot of people would just say, I don't want to keep coming back to these services. So I think they do have some incentive to fix some of these things that surface in their own research.